Take a deep breath and relax. You are not your savior. It's not the amount of faith you have. It's not the intensity of your faith. It's not about the quality or duration of your faith. The Lord Jesus Christ is your savior. If you trust in him and his shed blood and resurrection for salvation from your sins, in the same way you simply trust that a chair will hold you up when you go to sit down, that is enough. You aren't saved by any amount of anything you bring. The Lord Jesus Christ is your salvation in every way. Take a deep breath and relax. Now take another. You truly can rest in Christ. Let's see how resting in Christ works. To do that, we need to start with Adam's original sin, Adam's death and the curse of sin. God told Adam, In the day that thou eatest, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die, Genesis 2 verse 17. In Genesis 3 verse 6, Adam ate of the tree. Yet, he lived another 900 years or so afterward, Genesis 5 verse 5. Since God cannot lie, Titus 1 verse 2, we know that Adam died the very day that he ate of the wrong tree. Therefore, we must conclude that it was his soul, not his flesh, that died that day. Romans 6 verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death. Romans 3 verse 23 says that all have sinned. Therefore, we were all dead, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. This means that all of us deserve to spend eternity in the lake of fire. The problem is that, if God did not tell us this, we would not know it. To understand this, let's use an example. When you grow up poor, you do not really know that you are poor, because everyone around you is poor. It is only later in life, when you move up in life, that you realize that you were poor as a child. Similarly, when you are a sinner, you do not realize that you are a sinner until you see life without sin. The problem is that there is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3 verse 10. Therefore, if you compare yourself with others, you will not see your sin. That is why Paul said that those measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12. Yet, that is what most people do. They say, I will have eternal life, because I am a good person. I obey the Ten Commandments as best I can, and I do not intentionally hurt anyone. However, the way to have eternal life is not to do more good deeds than bad. Because God is holy, if we were to try to dwell with God with even one sin on our lives, it would mar God's holiness. Therefore, only those with sinless perfection earn the gift of eternal life. Romans 2 verse 7 calls this, patient continuance in well-doing. This is why God said, Be ye holy, for I am holy, 1 Peter 1 verse 16. Since there is none that doeth good, no, not one, Romans 3 verse 12, if a person were to base his eternal destiny upon what he observes, he would conclude that he is okay. Therefore, he would go to hell in ignorance. Ignorance is no excuse for the law. God's provision, the conscience. When Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he now had a sin nature. The sin nature is why all of us sin. Romans 5 verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Because God loves us, not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter 3 verse 9, he gave us the conscience, which is the knowledge of good and evil. Thus, contained within the sin that Adam committed is also God's provision to recognize sin. This is why, even though God gave the Mosaic law to Israel, the Gentiles still know that they are sinners because they have the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, Romans 2 verse 15. In other words, by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3 verse 20, and so all people know that they are sinners and are worthy of death, Romans 1 verse 32. The law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Romans 7 verse 12. By contrast, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Romans 7 verse 18. Therefore, when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Romans 7 verse 9. Now, you may think that God just made things worse, because the conscience works with my sin nature to cause me to sin more. However, this is actually a good thing. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Romans 7 verse 13. 
In other words, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3 verse 23, all are dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 verse 1, and will go to hell for their sin. Since God does not want anyone to go to hell, he lighteth every man that cometh into the world, John 1 verse 9, by giving man a conscience. This conscience provides the light of an objective standard that is not found in the world due to man's sin. Moreover, the sin nature works with the light of the conscience to become exceeding sinful so that your sinfulness can exceed your pride not to recognize your sin. Therefore, if you're honest with yourself, you will acknowledge what the conscience tells you, which is that your sin makes you worthy of death, Romans 1 verse 32. As Acts 2 verse 37 says, you will be pricked in your heart and ask the question, what shall we do? The answer to that question is to believe the gospel, which today is to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. Therefore, God gave us the law of the conscience so that it could work with the sin nature so that we would sin more so that we would recognize our sin so that we would recognize our need to have faith in God to save us. As God says in John 1 verse 9, the conscience puts a light on our sin so that we can see it so that we come to the true light, the Lord Jesus Christ, to save us. Without this conscience, we would not recognize our sin and have faith in God to save us. Thus, the conscience's work with our sin nature to cause us to sin more is actually God's provision so that we might have faith in what God tells us to have faith in. God is not concerned with the details. It is essential that we recognize that the specific details of the conscience are of no concern to God. God leaves this up to the parents and society to instill values in a person. For example, most people of my generation grew up with the idea in their conscience that man lying with mankind is a sin. Today's generation, for the most part, has grown up with the idea in their conscience that men abusing themselves with mankind is okay. Note that God does not interfere with the process of filling up the conscience to try to get everyone to believe exactly the same things. Why? Because, regardless of what is in the conscience, it will still work with the sin nature to cause someone to sin. If I think that man lying with mankind is a sin, I will be tempted to sin in that way. If I do not think that man lying with mankind is a sin, I will be tempted to use this idea to sin in other ways. James 2 verse 10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Therefore, even if man lying with mankind is eliminated as a sin, there are plenty of other sins to take its place. Let's say, for example, that the only rule in your conscience is that you cannot eat a grape. That is the only rule that God gave Adam to follow. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Romans 7 verse 18, I find then a law, that, when I would do good, evil is present with me. Romans 7 verse 21, why is that? Because whatsoever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14 verse 23. In other words, as long as I try to obey my conscience, I will fail in my attempt, regardless of what is in my conscience. I will then learn the lesson that I am a sinner in need of the Savior. Before you are saved, you are dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 verse 1. A dead person has no power to do anything. The only power within him is the sin nature. All the sin nature can do is sin. Therefore, if I have the law of not eating a grape stored up in my conscience, and I try to obey the law under my own power, I will use the sin nature to do so. Since all the sin nature can do is sin, I will end up eating the grape, or, at the very least, I will desire to eat the grape, which is sin in itself. This is stated by God's word as follows, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members, Romans 7 verse 23. The sin nature works with my flesh to defeat the law in my conscience. God's answer for your sin, Christ. When I learned this lesson, I exclaim, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this stuff? Romans 7 verse 24. I then start looking for the answer. When I hear the word of God, i.e., the gospel, I believe it, and the faith of Christ comes to me to save me. Romans 10 verse 17. 
In other words, God did not give you a conscience so you could obey your conscience. God gave you a conscience so you would recognize your need to believe the gospel. Therefore, once I conclude that I need God to save me, the conscience is of no use to me. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Galatians 3 verses 24 to 25. Therefore, ye are not under the law, but under grace. Romans 6 verse 14. Therefore, all things are lawful unto slash for me. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12 and 10 23. This means that I can be the absolute worst offender of the law after I am saved, and it does not affect my salvation one iota. The reverse is also true, i.e., that I can be the best keeper of the law before I am saved and still go to hell. Such a statement is considered utter blasphemy by all of churchianity. However, it is the truth of God's word. Until you recognize this, you will only serve yourself rather than God. The Problem with Grace Given my story of being sick, vomiting, and constantly worrying about going to hell when I die, it was the greatest news I had ever heard when I learned that God says in His Word that I cannot, under any circumstances, lose my salvation. Yet, nearly 100% of all fundamental, churchgoers would object to such a statement. Why not accept this great news? There are two main reasons why churchgoers would try to get me to worry about my salvation again. One, the flesh, and two, money. The flesh. We mentioned earlier that, when Adam ate a grape from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, his soul died, because God said that it would, Genesis 2 verse 17, yet his flesh continued to live for another 900 years. We also mentioned that, when you believe the gospel, God makes you alive in Christ, but God still keeps you in your vile flesh, according to Philippians 3 verse 21. For your entire life, before you were saved, the sin nature worked with your conscience and used your flesh to carry out your sin. All you did was sin. Once you were saved, you became alive in Christ so that you could serve God and live above sin. This is the greatest thing that could happen to you, but it actually infuriates your flesh. An example may help illustrate why this is the case. Let's say that I try for hours to open a jar and am unsuccessful. I then set the jar down. Someone immediately picks up the jar and opens it right away without any effort. You would think that I would be overjoyed because I can now get inside the jar. Instead, my flesh says, I loosened it up for him to open. Why? Because it is a blow to my pride to see someone easily accomplish something that was impossible for me to do. Similarly speaking, your flesh has been trying all of your life to live a righteous life, and it has failed every single time. Someone comes along and shares the gospel, showing that you do not need to live righteously because Christ did that for you. All you have to do is believe. What a wonderful truth. Yet, your flesh has its pride and gets upset. That is why most people will not believe the gospel. Instead, they will say, I'm okay because I try to keep the Ten Commandments. I'm okay because I am a good person or I'm okay because I go to church. Your flesh will think up any excuse it can in order to continue to remain alive and have your spirit be dead. If you do believe the gospel, things will only get worse for your flesh, because now your spirit is alive in Christ and God has reckoned your flesh to be dead. Romans 6 verse 11. You also now have the spirit of Christ residing within you. Galatians 4 verse 6. So, your flesh has been unsuccessful in obtaining life, and now the spirit of Christ is residing with your flesh and he has life in him. Therefore, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, Galatians 5 verse 17. Another characteristic of your flesh is that it is desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17 verse 9. It is so desperate, in fact, that it does not mind looking godly in order to get its way. Ordinances, such as touch not, taste not, handle not, have indeed a shoe of wisdom in will worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh, Colossians 2 verses 20 to 23. In other words, the flesh says, I see that the Spirit has life, so, I'm going to do the things of the Spirit. I will observe ordinances that neglect the body. In doing so, the flesh is worshiping its own will to accomplish the things of God apart from Christ. In other words, it is showing that it can do what the Spirit does. 
Thus, the flesh is satisfied, but it has deceived you into thinking that you have satisfied the spirit. This goes along with the rest of Jeremiah 17 verse 9 that I did not quote, which says, The heart is deceitful above all things. When you are saved, the flesh rebels against the Spirit of Christ within you by trying to look good on its own by getting you to perform the lusts of the flesh, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, 2 Timothy 3 verse 5. Money The second reason churchgoers doubt eternal security is money. You probably know that religion is big business. That is because it exalts the flesh while appearing to exalt the spirit, and humans are all about portraying a good image to others. Alcohol, drugs, pornography, etc. are big business, too, because they satisfy the flesh. The problems with these things is that they bring shame. These things are done in secret because family and friends will scold the person for being involved in such things. Religion also exalts the flesh, as we have seen, but it has a form of godliness. Therefore, religion is the best of both worlds, i.e., it satisfies your flesh and it satisfies the flesh of family and friends. They will not scold you by saying, how dare you practice religion, it's evil. Instead, you need to shoot up some heroin. No. They will brag about you to others of how you have turned your life around by going to church and being a good person now. So, not only will people practice religion because it satisfies their flesh, but they will also practice religion because it will give them praise from others, thus exalting their pride. This is the reason the church I grew up in existed. The members of that church could proudly proclaim to others that they never smoke, never drink, never curse, never get angry, and never sin. They are like little Jesus on earth. People will pay big money to feel good by doing evil things, and they will pay even bigger money to feel good by doing evil things that appear to be good things. That is why 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You see, if they teach the truth, the flesh will rebel against it, and people will not follow them. People have itching ears, 2 Timothy 4 verse 3, meaning that they want their flesh to be satisfied, not their spirit. Thus, they turn away their ears from the truth and turn to fables, il Timothy 4 colon 4. Therefore, if a church wants to prosper in this world, it will teach lies. That is why 1 Timothy 6 verse 9 says, They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Guilt. The main lust of the flesh that is used in churches is guilt. Given my background, I know all about this. If a church preaches the truth that you cannot lose your salvation and that all things are lawful unto you, there is no guilt. In fact, God says that the blood of Christ purges your conscience from having to do dead works to please God. Hebrews 9 verse 14. In other words, the blood of Christ eliminates all guilt. If Christians truly grasp this concept, the flesh would say that we do not have to worry about sin. In fact, we can sin more, Romans 6 verse 1. Therefore, I do not need to go to church, and I do not need to give anyone any money. In fact, when it comes to money, God says that we should give as we purpose in our heart, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. We are not required to give anything. If churches taught this, very few people would give. Also, very few people would attend church because they would not see the need to do so. Therefore, nearly all churches teach a tithe and try to guilt you into giving money above their mandatory 10%. You can think of it like a job. Your flesh does not want to work. It would rather lie in bed all day or do something it considers fun. Yet, millions of people go to work most days to do jobs that they do not want to do. But, they work because they have to in order to pay the bills. If someone won millions of dollars in the lottery, he would probably quit his job immediately, never to return again. Churches like this, the flesh does not want to go to church. If you know that your sin debt has been completely paid by Christ, there is nothing for you to do in order to be saved. If you know that your life is hid with Christ in God, Colossians 3 verse 3, there is nothing for you to do to stay saved. The guilt over your sin has been completely removed. So, why go to church? How churches operate? Knowing this, churches operate on your guilt. First, they keep the gospel a secret. 
Satan does this, 2 Corinthians 4 verses 3 to 4, by having his ministers lead churches, 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 to 15. In fact, most churches do not even know what the gospel is. Even if they do, they are not going to tell it to you. A pastor will say from the pulpit, we need to get the gospel to unreached nations. We need to proclaim the gospel to those we meet. We are here to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Gospel this, gospel that, everything is gospel, gospel, gospel. Yet, they never actually tell you what the gospel is. Even if they do share a salvation message, it will probably be a false gospel. They will probably tell you to turn from your sins, make Jesus the Lord of your life, invite Jesus into your heart, be water baptized as a profession of faith, or a host of other things other than the clear gospel, which is to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sin, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. Notice how I keep mentioning what the real gospel is. That is because I want you to go to heaven. Thus, they make you think that you are closer to heaven because they keep talking about heaven, the Bible, and Jesus, but they never actually tell you how to receive eternal life. Thus, you have to keep coming to the church, week after week, so that you feel like you are in good standing with God. Even if they somehow slip up and tell you the gospel that saves you, they will still try to get you to follow laws so that you have to keep performing, which means you have to keep coming to their church and putting money in the offering. That is why many people will not go to church, because they say they are not good enough. Yet, God did not wait for us to clean up our act before saving us. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 verse 8 Yet, churches constantly try to get people to obey the Ten Commandments and other laws. Then, they have you take a sip of grace juice and eat a bite of a cracker in order to make you feel guilty over all the sins you have committed over the last week. If you are going to make me feel guilty, at least give me a full meal. Since you never quite measure up to the standards that they say that God wants you to meet, you feel guilty and end up giving a bunch of money in the offering to alleviate that guilt. If they told you the truth, that I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God, Galatians 2 verse 19, you would not feel guilty over your sin, you wouldn't have a reason for coming to church, and they would not get your money. Therefore, they perform a vain jangling of the law before you, 1 Timothy 1 verses 6 to 7, to get your money. And, going back to the pride reason, it makes you feel good that you did something to appease God's wrath, i.e., you went to church and gave money. This makes you feel just a little bit better than the non-churchgoers, which, to the flesh, makes it worth every penny you put into the offering plate. Churchianity's Relative Morality This is why Churchianity's morality does not adhere to the Bible. Rather, it is always just a little higher than the rest of society. Therefore, as morality has gone down over the last 100 years in the United States, so has Churchianity's morality, even though the Bible has not changed. It is quite common today for churchgoers to drink at least some alcohol, and they even use 1 Timothy 5 verse 23 as a biblical command to drink wine, even though that is not what the verse says. Yet, back in 1920, a churchianity movement in the United States got the prohibition law passed. Today, although churchgoers may still frown upon it, it is almost assumed. That churchgoing couples engage in premarital sex, even though churchianity took a great stand against this in the 1950s. In the 1980s, church groups picketed outside of abortion clinics to stop babies from being killed, yet there is not the same outcry among churchianity today. Until recently, churchianity was against man abusing himself with mankind, but now it is becoming accepted or at least not spoken against by churchianity. God did not change his stance on these issues. It is just that churchianity always has a cause to fight for in order to appear morally superior to the rest of society. Once society is given over to a sin, such that churchianity wants to participate in it as well, churchianity accepts that sin and moves on to some other cause to fight. This is nothing new. Jesus said that the Jewish religious leaders of his day emphasized tithing so much that they even made it a point to tithe their spices yet they omitted the weightier matters of the law, Matthew 23 verse 23. In other words, religion loves to take a stand for what is right on one certain topic. 
That way, they can get society to focus on their stand, so as to steer the attention away from other sins that they can now get away with. As Jesus said, Ye, strain at a gnat, and swallow a camel, Matthew 23 verse 24. Or, as we might say today, ye strain at transgenderism and swallow pornography and adultery. The conscience is a good thing. Now, you may feel sorry for me that I had so many rules to follow as a kid that I was constantly scared of losing my salvation and became physically sick on many occasions, as a result. However, this was actually a good thing. Granted, God was not pleased that I was suffering physically due to bad doctrine. But the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Galatians 3 verse 24 My suffering physically eventually led me to have faith in Jesus' death as atonement for my sins, which means that I will not suffer forever in the lake of fire. That is a much better situation than feeling good about myself all of my life, only to end up suffering forever in hell fire. Jesus said something similar when he stated, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, Mark 9 verse 43. Or, in my case, it is better to recognize your sin and get sick over it every single week so that you eventually believe the gospel and spend eternity in heaven than it is to blindly follow religion and go to hell in a handbasket. The Problem with Churchianity Therefore, it is important for us to understand that we should listen to our conscience before we are saved, or else we will never believe the gospel. It is also important that we understand that we should not try to follow that same law of the conscience after we are saved. In other words, once we are saved, we have graduated from law university. Ye are not under the law, but under grace. Romans 6 verse 14 The problem is that, because this message does not get people to come to church and give money, Churchianity does not teach it. As mentioned previously, churchianity wants to keep you under the law. Therefore, the conscience, which God gave you to learn to have faith in God, is used by Satan through churchianity to keep you in bondage to the law after you are saved. That through death he, Christ, might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hebrews 2 verses 14 to 15. That was me. I was subject to bondage through fear of death, and Christ died so he could deliver me, and all people, for that matter, from that bondage. Yet, churchianity wants to keep you in bondage. In fact, not only did the church I grew up in not deliver me from bondage, but it also put me into more bondage. I realize I am an extreme case, but nearly all churches seek to put you in bondage through some kind of performance-based system. The differences among the Christian church denominations boil down to how much bondage you are under in each system. Why? Because no man ever yet hated his own flesh, Ephesians 5 verse 29, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. Therefore, as many as desire to make a fair shoe in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. Today, it is water baptized, become a member of the church, give tithes, pray the rosary, etc., only lest. They should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ, Galatians 6 verse 12. In other words, my flesh does not want to suffer persecution, and it will die daily, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 31, if I allow Christ to live in me. Therefore, I can use my flesh, cloaked in a form of godliness, to trick myself into thinking I am serving God, and then I do not have to suffer because I am not really serving God. At the same time, the world thinks I am great because of my form of godliness, 2 Timothy 3 verse 5. If I do not want to endure sound doctrine and I want to follow after my own lusts instead, then I will heap to myself teachers, who will scratch my itching ears, i.e., satisfy the lusts of my flesh, 2 Timothy 4 verse 3. Because these teachers are teaching fables, rather than the truth, 2 Timothy 4 verse 4, the result is that they are ensnared by the devil, taken captive by him at his will, 2 Timothy 2 verse 26. So, these teachers make my flesh feel good, but my spirit is depraved. My soul, then, wonders if I am even saved. As a result, it is a rarity that any churchgoer on his deathbed today can say, beyond the shadow of a doubt, 
that he is absolutely sure that he is about to go to heaven. Inevitably, what ends up happening in churches is that most people give up on serving the Lord. Even if they heard and believed the gospel for today, they are immediately put under the law again, such that they do not even know the transformation that God made of their soul and their spirit. Instead, they are taught that God has changed their flesh, empowering it to serve God, rather than Christ serving God through their spirit. For example, it is very rare to find a church that will teach that the baptism of Romans 6 verses 3 to 4 is a dry baptism by the Spirit into Christ's death and resurrection, even though that is what the verses clearly teach. Instead, once you are saved, a church will tell you that you need to be water baptized. Thus, they replace the spirit baptism of this passage with a fleshly baptism that does absolutely no good except make a fair shoe in the flesh. Therefore, from the beginning, new church converts are conditioned to believe that Christ died for me, the least I can do is live for him, with the implication that this new life is lived out of the energies of the flesh. Yet, God says that, even after you are saved, your flesh is still vile. Philippians 3 verse 21. So, the new believer tries to serve the Lord, but he fails. It is like what Paul said, For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is that I find not. Romans 7 verse 18. The result is that the churchgoer begins to think that this salvation thing is a hoax, much like I experienced with sanctification. I was told that the Adamic nature was eradicated when I was sanctified, such that I would no longer sin. Yet, I found no difference in my inner man. Of course, I believed that I was not really sanctified, yet I had to appear to everyone that I was sanctified. Therefore, I tried even harder, if that were possible, to obey the law. I looked so good to others that I received a special, Christian maturity award, but I had greater turmoil, because I knew I was trying to portray a life that I was not really living on the inside. The same thing happens with the churchgoer. The result is that he will do one of two things. In the first scenario, he will put on a big smile when he goes to church, act nice to everyone, and try to keep up appearances when important people are watching. When no one is watching, he will live as the sinner that he knows he is. All the while, he will feel guilty for being two-faced and will believe that the gospel is just a scam, or he will believe eternal life with God is possible, but that he is not truly saved. That is why most every churchgoer will doubt his salvation all the way to his deathbed. The second scenario is that he will give up. He will determine that the church life is too hard, and he will go back to his old ways without putting up a front. However, this is a blow to a person's pride. Most people would rather suffer internally and look good to others outwardly, than to admit that they were stupid for believing what a church said. Therefore, churches are full of people who put up a front for an hour each Sunday, only to return to their sinful ways afterward. As a result, once they leave the church on Sunday morning, they go to a restaurant, where they do not tip the waitress well and act rude to her, because their flesh is grieved from putting up a front for a whole hour. This is why waitresses hate working the Sunday afternoon shift. The good news is that God's power to save you from sin is real. Only by understanding who you are in Christ after you are saved can you live in this reality. Therefore, let's get to the good part what God gives you when you are saved.